Well, open your Bible to Psalm 116. And while you're turning there, um, I've just got to tell you one of the regular things that I like to do that I'd encourage you to do if it's not a part of your routine, if you like to listen to podcasts, there is one podcast you'll hear me recommend, and it is Dr. Albert Moeller's The Briefing. It is the best place for you to go and get a handle on what's happening in the world and see it through the lens of a Christian worldview. It's better than anything else I could tell you. But sometimes Dr. Moeller surprises you. He goes from talking about things of great import, of great seriousness, to this past Friday, he talked about something that he started out to say just a sweet story. Now, rarely do you hear Dr. Mueller use the expression sweet on his podcast. But I was struck by it because he had ran across an article that talked about a finding from science, a scientific article written about some research that was done. It was published in England about the reason why Mama ducks have baby ducklings following the mama duck in a line. Now, I'm telling you, it's a very rare thing to hear Dr. Mueller talking about ducklings, but he did today, this day. And, and his whole point was, was that this study had come out that said that, that they have done the research to look into the dynamics as to why when you see ducks swimming across a pond or some body of water, the little baby ducks always fall in line with the mama ducks. And it is very, it's very interesting. I will tell you that if you have ever just my four kids walking across the parking lot, there is very rarely this sense of uniformity into what's happening. So when you see that event and you see these baby ducklings, and why is it that in, thank you very much, I'll drink that later. When, uh, <laughs> when, when, you, when you see those baby ducklings following mama duck, why is it that they just always seem to be right in line with each other? And Dr. Mueller said that the study results rendered the reason as to why, that there's a science behind it that, that changes the flow of the water, that the first duck that follows the mama duck is able to take care of that destructive wave moving against the, the little baby ducks and moves all the water in such a way that it hits this sweet spot that all of those little babies find great benefit in following in the wake of the mother as she is moving across the pond. And after giving all the science and some very nice other details describing why this is so good, he lands on the result that something we need not miss is that God has made it that way for a reason, that there's a natural way for God to care, for show, show care between a mama duck and these baby ducks. And every time you see that, that's according to God's design. And when I think about that natural thing of seeing those ducks making their way across the pond, it made me think about our text today for this simple reason. We need to learn as believers in Jesus how we're to live our lives in a natural way, the way that God intended for us to live. And can I suggest to you today that if you know the Lord Jesus is your personal Savior, and you've trusted Him, and you're living for Him, that the natural rhythm of your life needs to be the rhythm of thanksgiving. That's just the way that God designed us to live. It should be the motivation behind everything that we do. And in fact, if we stop on Thursday and we acknowledge Thanksgiving as a holiday, I'm glad we do it. But the reality of the matter is we should live every day with this deep sense of a binding and motivating thankfulness. And that is the natural way that God has designed for us to live. But then we have to ask our question, ourselves, why then is it so hard to live a life that is ruled by and governed by thanksgiving? And if you're honest, it's really hard to live your life that way. And I believe there's a number of reasons why that is true. Not long ago, I was listening to the teaching of John Piper, and I'm going to paraphrase what Piper said but he basically says that one of the products of the fall is that God's glory, as we see it manifested in life, becomes way too ordinary way too quickly. And that's one of the reasons it's hard for us to give thanks. I want you to think of God's glory this way. When you consider the reflection of his glory every single morning when the sun comes up with all of his brilliance, 
When you consider what we get to watch every night is the canopy of sky illuminates the darkness and we're able to see the furthest light in the beauty of the night sky. When you think about the sweetness of the voice of your loved ones that you get to enjoy every single day, how that should bring us to a place of regular praise and thanksgiving before the Lord. But instead of living that way, we've gotten so used to and accustomed to those things, instead of responding with thanks, we respond with a yawn. There's other things that I think that makes it hard for us to live a life of thanksgiving. It happens very often that when our circumstances become far too heavy, or when the heartbreak of our suffering feels like it is more than we can bear, the deep freeze of our afflictions seem to easily overcome the warmth of a life of gratitude. So if you have found yourself in a situation like I often do, that it's hard to live your life the way that God wants us to with, na- with thanksgiving, if you're tired of living according to that which is unnatural, and allowing that which is unnatural to conquer the quality of life that God has declared to be natural, and that we live each day with thanksgiving, then can I submit to you that this morning's psalm is for you and for me? The Church of England has appointed this psalm as the psalm of thanksgiving every time a new child is born. And many churches often read this psalm with regularity when they come before the Lord's table and celebrate communion. And we don't know the particular life situation that inspired the psalmist. In fact, we don't even know who wrote it. But the experience that informs the content of this psalm is an experience that is echoed by every person who has ever lived. All of our stories are all different, but all of us with regularity have to contend with the soul-numbing, murderous attack that we face in a world that is under the sway of the ancient serpent. So this psalm is for us all, and it begins in verse 1, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold of me. I suffered distress and anguish. And then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our Lord is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, and I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all mankind are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits to me? I'll lift up the cup of salvation. And call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. I have loosed my bonds. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. What a beautiful psalm of thanksgiving. And as you consider what we just read, this is a central truth that I pray will not just carry you today, but will be something that you remember all week long as you gather with your families this Thanksgiving, as you think about our need to live our lives in the natural way. Here's what I want you to consider. Every true Christian who has been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ possesses a heart of thanksgiving. Every one of us do. If we know the Lord, it's a part of what is true of us. So I want you to consider what it says right out of the gate in verse 1. I love the Lord. Why? Because he heard my voice. 
the gratitude that will dominate all of Psalm 116. All of this gratitude is soon to come to light. But before we can get to the part of the psalm that discusses our need to give thanks, our hearts must begin with this verse 1 because it starts with our hearts being filled with a love for God. The psalmist makes it very certain. He deeply loves the Lord. Or to interpret the Hebrew from this text more accurately, more precisely, our singer who has written these words has fully dedicated himself to Yahweh because his all-powerful God has focused his hearing on his voice. And God in this time has heard the psalmist's desperate cry. So as you read this opening verse as to why the psalmist loves the Lord, we see the reason why, but we have to then really ask ourselves, why is this enough? Why is God's attention, without any mention at this point of his action, enough for the psalmist to profess his allegiance and his love for God? And when I think about the answer as to why the simple hearing from the Lord is enough to give forth this word of love from the psalmist, I have to answer the question why by telling you the difference between who God is and who we often are. I'm going to personalize it and just talk about me in a way that will hopefully help make this make sense to you. But I want to tell you, it wasn't a few weeks ago, Allie and I were going through our house and there were some things that I have left on the list that needed to be done this fall, but just to be quite honest, for a numerous, for numerous reasons, all of which were valid, some of those things on the list that should have been checked off earlier were still on that list. I mean, I've got a lot of important stuff to do, and Allie understands that, so she's real patient with me. And, and one of those important, very difficult tasks that I needed to do was to take care of the air filter for my HVAC unit that is located in my attic. That's where the furnace is. That's where this air filter needed to be changed out. And I have to do it. Now, you're going to really feel sorry for me. This important task happens once a year. Can you believe I have to do this? And it requires all kinds of effort. Allie is so thankful for me because the thing that it starts with is I have to go to that 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 attic door that's in my ceiling right out of my bed next to our bedroom that is operated by that little rope that hangs down. And, and, and you know what that rope is for? It's so you can tug and put great effort in yanking down that door. And whenever I do, it's like Christmas has come and there are little snowflakes of, 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 of insulation that falls on the sides of the door. And after that falls down, it's wonderful. You pull that thing down, and then it's got that fun ladder that lets you get up in the attic. You know, the kind that bends, and it's attached, and you have to ratchet that thing on down. And I'm telling you, it is hard work, y'all. It is tough. I have to lower that door. I have to drop down that ladder. I have to open the box for the air filter that weighs about three whole pounds, and I have to take it out of this plastic container and navigate. Now, you're really going to feel bad for me. I have to walk up the steps with the air filter in one hand. And when I get to the top, I have to take off the metal door and pull out the old filter and making sure the airflow is correct, insert the new filter, close the door, come down the steps, discard to the dump, the two-pound filter that's no longer useful, I have to take that ladder, that awful ladder, and fold it one time and let go of the rope to where it shatters the house and everything, and, and, and it's done. Can you believe? I? And for whatever the reason, that takes so long and so much effort, that box of that air filter sat in my, in my bedroom for months before I finally took the time to do it. And in fact, a couple of weeks ago, I was like, what are you going to do with that box? I said, oh, don't worry. I'll do it the next day. And then three weeks later, I finally went about doing the task of taking care of the business. Now, why do I share that with you? Because when you read about Psalm 116, how the psalmist is able to declare his love for God because of what God has done in hearing the cry of his servant. 
The difference in who God is and who we are make it hard for us to understand verse 1. We want to know that there is going to be evidence that backs the hearing. When you hear that something needs to be done, you want to know that that need has been met before you're able to unleash and lavish love and thankfulness for that having been done. But when it comes to the Lord, you don't even have to wonder, will God make good on what he has heard? Whenever God hears, his habit is to act. He doesn't delay. He doesn't wait. He doesn't procrastinate. He doesn't give excuses. When God hears his people and they cry out to him in their despair, God makes it his habit to come to the rescue every time. And the psalmist understands this, so he cries out and says, I love the Lord because God has heard me. And after you understand the trust that the psalmist has in the Lord, now you're under, able to understand the rest of what this text teaches us. There is a difference in what we do when we hear from God's Word and we struggle to obey what we have heard and what God does when He listens to the cry of His people who love Him because He does not struggle. He comes to their rescue every time. And His inevitable rescue is what's recorded in verses 3 through 6. And I told you we don't know who wrote this psalm. It might have been David. It might have been King Hezekiah. It might have been someone who was with Moses in the days of deliverance of Exodus. But if it was David who wrote this song, it could be describing King Saul's murderous pursuit. Or it could be describing David's son Absalom's betrayal as he was making every effort to steal away from his father his throne. If it was Hezekiah, and he was the author of this psalm, that good king could have been singing of the danger that he faced as he felt the internal spread of a terminal illness that was overtaking his body. Death, the text says in verse 3, is humanity's hunter. And it suffocates its prey, as described here, with inescapable ropes. And the pains of hell were pulling this psalter firmer and firmer into death's grip. So the eternal torment was becoming unavoidable. And in desperation, this suffocated, captured singer cries out to God, O oh Lord, save my life, and the God who is filled with grace and with righteousness and indescribable mercy. Verse 6 says, this God, he saved me. If we are going to be a people who live out a life of thanksgiving, the natural way to live, it begins by us remembering what God has restored Whoever you are or wherever you are, you never look for this evil huntsman, but he always comes looking for you. And when you face a threat, maybe like David's threat of betrayal, or maybe like Hezekiah's threat of a terminal illness, whatever your enemy is, can I just tell you this morning, it all comes from the same source. The huntsman of hell has picked up the scent of your sinful nature and you have been trapped by the ropes of death and scorched by the pains of hell. But when you call out to Jesus and you pray to him for your deliverance, though you were brought low, as the psalmist describes, Jesus is there every time and he saves you. Even though you cannot run to God, he runs and comes to you. So as you enter into this Thanksgiving season, remember to give thanks. He has restored you. But along with the restoration, as we continue to read, and we unpack the verses in verse 7 and forward, there's something else that I want you to consider. Because we also need to receive what God has revealed. When you come to verse 7 and you begin to unpack it, Understand everything that's already taken place in verses 1 through 6. God has already thwarted the effort of the soul's evil huntsman. The psalmist rejoices, for salvation has come. 
And God has returned the psalmist, as it says in verse 7, to a state of rest. The battle has subsided. And now the psalmist can think and can meditate on the goodness of God. And the psalmist is able to rejoice, for salvation has come to him. I love the way in the inside of William Plummer in his commentary on this text, for he asks the question about the rest that this text speaks. What is rest for the soul, he asks? It's not the promised land, as some say, but rest is God himself. And in this place of rest in God, the singer of this psalm understands that he has life because God has commanded and forced death to let him loose. And thanks to what God has done, the psalmist's eyes has been kept. They've been kept from shedding tears of grief. His feet have remained on the ground of sure footing, not allowing him to tumble into the grave. And what comes next now that the threat of death has been removed is a glorious revelation. The psalmist can now walk on the paths of the most ancient parents, Adam and Eve, as they would live in the Garden of Eden and walk with the Lord in the cool of the day, because now the psalm can walk with the Lord in the land of the living. So this psalm, as much as any other place in the Bible, shows this great contrast between death and life. And it defines for us biblically what death truly is and what life truly is. So when you think about death in Psalm 116, understand it this way. Death means separation from God. And life means that you are filled and you are living your life filled with God's presence. Living your life in God's presence. So that's the difference in life and death. You're in the presence of the Lord or you're separated from Him. So isn't this beautiful? Those of us who are in Christ who know what it is to live according to what Jesus has done, and you've given your life to him, and you're living for his glory. This psalm helps to deepen our understanding of some of the most glorious of gospel truths about life. Remember what it says in John 10.10? 10, when it's talking about the difference of Satan and Jesus and why he's come? In John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, The thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy, to bring death. But I came that they may have life and have that life abundantly. So in the presence of God, you're given abundant life. Think about the promise of John chapter 11, just one chapter over, verse 25. On the occasion of Martha mourning the loss of her brother Lazarus, as Jesus is about to speak to Lazarus and raise him from the dead, Jesus declares in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So here's the difference. Death is separation from God, and life is life lived in the presence of God. And what that tells us, if you're a believer in Jesus, is this. That life's meaning, life's joy, life's purpose can only be found in the presence of the Lord. And if you have found him and you live in his presence, you are living the life that God intended you to live. This is wonderful. It also should motivate us to share Christ with people who don't know him. Doesn't this change the way that you see the world? That if we really see the world as people who have Christ and don't have Christ, those who are dead or those who are living, those, if you can imagine them, as I said a few weeks ago, it's this, that evangelist who used to say, I see everyone in the world as if they've got an L on their forehead or an S on their forehead. And I assume they have an L unless they give me reason to believe that they have an S. It should cause us to long to see as many people hear the gospel as we can because this is the only way they can experience life. And though they might look like they've got it all together, though they look like they've got everything in order, that their family looks the part and they've got the 401k and everything seems secure, if they don't have Jesus, they are in separation from the Lord. They are living in death. When I think about the contrast, I tell you, I've done a lot of funerals in recent months. There's times that you just have waves of them as a pastor, and I've gone through quite a large wave of them recently. 
And I've worked with my friends over at Carmichael's. Often you go over there, and a, an hour before the family is, uh, opens the door for other visitors to come and express their care, they have an hour or so to spend in the room with the body of their lost loved one, of their, the lo- loved one that they lost. And in those moments, it's a sweet time to be with them. But can I tell you, no matter how good of a job those guys do, making the body look pleasant, no matter how much work they do, the body stays dead. And though people look like they've got it all together, they're no different than that corpse in a casket if they do not have the Lord. And they may have comfort and security in all the things that this life has to offer, but Psalm 116 shows the contrast. Without Christ is separation and death in Jesus, and in Jesus alone is life. So the revelation that we need to receive is given to us right here. It's the difference between life and death. In the pursuit of riches and fame or prominence or anything else in your life, you fill in the blank. All, according to Philippians 3, is counted as loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. So when we want to live with a heart of thanksgiving, we need to remember what God has restored. As we backtrack and we think about the lyrics of this beautiful psalm, we love the Lord. Why? Because He has listened to our cry, and as is always God's habit, He has rescued us from the hounds of hell. And as we reflect on His rescue, and as we live in the peace that comes of the rest of living in the presence of God, We receive the revelation that life, which is filled with joy and meaning and purpose, is only found as we live our lives in union with our Deliverer. We can't find it anywhere else. So as we consider these truths, now we're ready for verses 12 and the end of the psalm. To live out our days in the land of the living, knowing that thanksgiving is our life's response. It's the only way to then live if you understand the fullness of the gospel and who God is and how we are to relate to him. Notice what it says in verse 12. There's a gripping question. What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits to me? What can I possibly give back to God when I consider all that God has given to me? And you know what the answer is? There's nothing I can do to compare. I can give him everything that I possess. I can give him everything that I ever want to do in the future, but there's nothing I can give to God that would render to God the payment of all of his benefits to me. So since I can't ever hope to pay him back and have to fully trust in his grace to give me something that I can never return, there's only one way then I can live. And it's not trying to constantly pay him back for what he's done, but the only response of the heart of a person who gets the gospel is thanksgiving. So I will lift a cup of salvation unto the Lord. The cup of thanksgiving, the cup of blessing that is spoken about in the Old Testament. And it was a cup that I believe when it is offered in the rightful way, it's not a cup from which you sip and then you offer to God the rest. It's a cup in which you give to God everything of its content. And it is poured out as a libation gift, fully given over to the Lord. What we read about in verse 12 is really what I think Romans 12 speaks of. Since the gospel is true, therefore, since God is filled with all of this wonderful mercy, I must offer my body as a living sacrifice. The only answer, the only opportunity to show him and to give him thanks is to give him every bit of who I am. Every bit of what I am, I just give it over to him. I am a living sacrifice, and that is my spiritual act of worship. And that is what it means to live your life with this response of thanksgiving. How shall I render to the Lord all of his benefits for me? 
And then read in verses 13 and following. I will pay my vows to the Lord, not just in private, but also in public. I will die with hope if Jesus tarries, because precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And though I might die on this side of eternity, if I die in Jesus, I'll experience one death, but I'll live twice instead of being experiencing two deaths and being separated from him forever. And I will then delight in the fact that I belong to him. Verse 16, Lord, I'm your servant. I don't fight that. I don't argue. I don't try to establish any other position. I'm your servant, the son of your main servant, because you have loosed my bonds. I'm completely given over to your authority. And I delight in the fact that I belong to you, so I offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And every single breath that I give you gives me the chance to praise the Lord. And that's how the psalm concludes. What a psalm. And even as it ends, I hope you've heard very clearly from start to finish the gospel right here in this psalm. Because as you apply this psalm to your own life and you sing it for the glory of God with all of your heart, you can do so because just as it says at the beginning of the psalm, verses 3 through 6, in our sin, the evil huntsman had us trapped. There was no rescue, and we felt the fire of hell scorching us as we knew that that was going to be our destination. But we cried out to God for his rescue, and we asked him to save us, and he has come, and he has rescued us. And when Jesus rescues us, and we enter into his rest, he raises us to new life in him. We're separated from death. We no longer have to worry about death. We can experience the fullness of life in Christ. And then the latter part of the psalm, every part of who we are is then given back to God with thanksgiving. What a psalm. As you read this psalm, just know that God loves you so much. And the question then is, do you love him? I sure hope you do. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes and while we get ready to wrap up our time together, I just want you to consider the truths that we find right here. Just to think deeply, do you trust him enough to love him just because he's heard you? Do you know that everything God has promised is absolutely certain and true? And when the psalmist says, I love the Lord because he has heard my cry, it comes with the absolute and abundant confidence that he's come to the rescue. And as you trust him in this way, not imposing upon him the lack of trust that is enforced by the way other people live, but the perfect way that God makes good of his promises every single time as you enter into the rest and the rescue that he gives, that's where he raises you to this fulfilling life filled with joy and purpose. As you live under his authority. So when you read this text, when I consider all that he has rendered, how can I render to him anything compared to all of his benefits to me? All you want to do is live a life of thanksgiving. Father, there's so much that gets in the way of these things, and I pray that we will not only receive them, but if there's anyone here today who's never received the gospel, they'll see the gospel clearly in this passage, that you are their rescuer as they cry out to you for help, that you raise them and remove the ropes and the pains of hell. And Father, we're raised to live life in you. That's how we were created, what we you always intended for us to live and Father I pray that we'll spend our days giving you thanks thank you so much for this text and in Jesus name we pray amen